Thank you to all our panelists for coming, making time to participate. Really appreciate it. And thanks to uh, the conference organizers, especially Jessica Gelman, who put this panel together. I want to start with a proposition, like the old uh, firing line debate shows. I want to see if you guys think that uh, this is crazy, or you agree, or somewhere in between. And here's, here's the proposition. Um, being a sports owner in a big American sports league is the sweetest job in American business. And there's two reasons I say that. One is, um, sports teams are monopolies, or at worst, duopolies. If I drive an ice cream truck through my neighborhood, and you think you can provide a better product at a better price, you can drive another truck through my neighborhood, and you can cut me out of the business. And it's really hard to do that against, let's say, the Mets or the Jets. Um, and the second reason is, is that- Well, you could provide a better product, I think. <laughs> 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 uh, the second you reason, did cite the Mets and the Jets. Well, that's, that's, yeah. I, I, I'm a New York team's yeah. fan, and yeah. that's why I cited them, yeah. Um, I happen to be a Jets fan, so I understand. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Jets fan. I know. I used to think you were smart. Yeah, is that, yeah? <laughs> did we finally find what your next step is going to be? Is that uh, No, definitely not. I mean, uh, dis despite your proposition there, I'm not actually getting ready to trade jobs for the non <laughs> Well, the, the second reason I, I say that is because whatever happens in the economy, demand for sports seems to keep going up and up and up, which drives uh, media rights fees. And whether or not your team performs on the field, um, most big league sports teams are in for something like an equal share of big media contracts. And so that money is guaranteed at the same time you have a protected monopoly. And I just use it, here's a number. Over the past five years, the value of the 122 major sports franchises the total aggregate value, according to Forbes, has increased by $69.7 billion. That's not the total value, that's the increase in value. So, um, Stan Kasson, I'll start with you. Um, is this the best gig imaginable? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not gonna say it isn't. It's a very <laughs> cool gig, no question about it. Even though there are days when I wish I was back on the ice cream truck that I really did drive when, when I was young, uh, because when I was doing that, I didn't have 500 outlets over the air on the internet dissecting everything I did. And if there was any business at all, even if I was completely right, media outlets don't think they have a show if they're just agreeing with everything I do. You know, so they, they have to invent controversy, they have to invent dissecting the most minute things. <clears throat> and, and on those days, it doesn't feel like the greatest job, but I can't disagree with your general proposition, with one exception. I think Adam will agree with me on this. We will never give any credence to Forbes valuations of franchise. Those things drive us a little nuts. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't disagree with the premise that it's a, a pretty cool business and a, and a pretty good life. That's not what we usually hear, though, right? We've been through labor strife in uh, three of the major sports over the past couple of years. And in the, dom dominating the headlines in each of those labor wars was the, was I think it's fair to say owners' characterization of their own business model as pretty abysmal. Um, I haven't encountered a lot of owners being willing to come out, I'm glad you did, to come out and say, yeah, this, this actually works. This works for me, this works for our sport. Do you, Jonathan Kraft, do you think that's fair or? It's, it's a complicated <coughs> question. Our, our main business is corrugated boxes and paper, so paper and packaging, the ultimate commodity. That's capital. his true passion. It is. <laughs> actually, no, but actually it is, and I love it. And being in a commodity basic business, when we bought the Patriots, we paid $173 million for a business that had negative EBITDA. So you think about that, and you go back to your original point, which is there are a limited number of these franchises, and I think that definitely helps drive the intrinsic value. And then as the business models have evolved over the last two decades, and as the media landscape has evolved, specifically cable and now digital, the, the intrinsic asset values are great, but you still have to manage the basic components of it like a business. And I think from a cash flow perspective, you don't see the types of returns that would dictate the types of values you talk about. You see it on sale because it's a diversification for people getting into it. There's a coolness factor, and they're definite, it's, it's definitely a way to play the changing media landscape. 
but the underlying values to Stan's point, I think, are really, are really m much less dictated by traditional business metrics than, than necessarily the scarcity value. That well, you let's point let's out. talk about the changing model. I, here's another number: um, from 1947 to 1956, in the old days, when the Yankees won 12 World Series, uh, I'm sorry, 10 World Series, uh, over that time. And, and we're playing in a market that, if anything, is more dominant in the culture and the media than it is today. The New York Yankees made a total of $3.6 million in profits. And even adjusted for inflation, <coughs> that shows a different scale, just completely, that sports is working in today. So, um, Adam, let me ask you, um, how is, when, when you deal with the owners who you're dealing with, how do you see their jobs and what they're doing, and even who they are, changing as opposed to 10, 20, 30 years ago? Right, well, you know, let, let me begin with your first question. And I think, I mean, I, I of course agree with Stan that people do it, there's an enormous amount of passion and um, joy that comes out of being a sports team owner. On the other hand, I think it's an extraordinarily difficult business. I, um, I, I don't agree that they are, in, in essence, monopolists in their community. We, our teams, other teams in, in other sports can compete against all other entertainment options in those communities. We on television, whether we're on ESPN or TNT or whatever network, we're competing against literally thousands of linear channels, unlimited <laughs> numbers of, um, in essence, broadband or, or internet programming options. And I think owners who come into this business who don't um, have an expectation that it takes an enormous amount of effort um, enormous amount of skill to be successful, invariably are disappointed and get out of the business. There's also the opportunity, to your point about um, the old days compared to what's happening now, there's also the opportunity to lose enormous amounts of money as well. And, and you mentioned collective bargaining. We came out of a collective bargaining cycle where, again, in a very transparent way, we shared our financials with our union and the majority of teams were losing money and significant amounts of money as well. So, well, it's true, you know, you, I, Franchise values are relevant, and you should take that into account, but there's also enormous amount of risk. Look at some of the prices now being paid for franchises. So I would just say I, th I think it's an extraordinarily difficult business. It's, it's, it's in part why the, there, there's been a much more sophisticated approach to the business now, hence conferences like these where you know, super smart and sophisticated students are getting into the industry, getting into this business, and approaching it in a very different way than they did when I first got into the business. What are some of the specifics about that? How are, how are owners and the, the men and women they hire and the organizations they set up, how are those different because of the complexities of the modern business than they used to be? Well, one, I, I would say just um, the, the, the size of the organizations. If I look back, I mean, Stan was no, the no. youngest GM ever in the NBA, right? Uh, uh, that was a very long time ago, but, but he's right. When I started, uh, uh, we had maybe five people in the Hawks front mm -hmm. office in, in the mid-70s. Um, and I remember uh, Ted Turner said to me my last year with the Hawks, which was about eight or nine years ago, back when we started, we had five people in the front office, and if everything went right, if we had a great year, we could make maybe a <coughs> million bucks. A and my last year with the Hawks, we had, you know, a hundred people in the front office, and if everything goes right, and we did had a great year, we could make maybe a million bucks. He, he said, "Why have we done all this?" Uh, it's because the business has and grown and sold. changed. And then he sold it. Yeah, um, but the business has changed in a lot of ways. Not the least of which is reaching out to more customers in different ways, and it has propelled asset values. And and that's the fallacy in all of this. Uh, the return comes, yes in the sale and you know the greater fool and all of that but on an ongoing basis on an EBITDA basis it really isn't there and that that's what too often is, is what Adam is talking about it'd it be, really is a daily struggle it'd be interesting um, if you took a secret poll among all owners and asked them the reason they own teams and what gives them the greatest satisfaction I would be surprised if EBITDA uh, rose well, you to know, the top John, of that list I, I completely agree with that yeah I, I think that's true, but I do think it's still important, especially when you're paying billions of dollars for something. Eventually, you need some financial return. When we bought the team in 94, the Patriots, the front office was much smaller, but here, less than 20 years later, there was no such thing as research. Today, there's a football research department that has half a dozen people in it, and there is, on the business side, 
uh, a research department. It's one of the things that reports to Jessica that also has about a half a dozen people in it. And we have a database that's managed virtually every day that touches about 12 areas of our organization with about 4 million unique names in it. And we're aggressively working it. Neither of those things existed 20 years yeah. ago. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to make one other point, which was the, look, it, it, it probably, and I, I don't denigrate the, your efforts to make money at all, but, it, but again, it has to be the largest American business for which the, the measure of your success is not how much money you make. I agree. At the end of the day, I mean, we do a franchise ranking, and I'm not even sure that, that profitability is a significant but, portion of how we are measuring success of franchise. Well, no, we, <coughs> it's not, we, we take zero EBITDA for a Super Bowl championship, so exactly. I agree with you. But, John, right. I would just right. say, and I think that's changing, though, because as the level of investment goes up, as the, you know, as the sophistication mm -hmm. of the enterprises goes up, I mean, profit used to be a dirty word. And right. I know when we went into our last collective bargaining cycle, a lot of people, even in our own office, advised us not to say publicly that one of our goals through collective bargaining was to have 30 teams, if well managed, have the ability to be profitable. Right. And we said, I mean, the only way that this business is going to grow, and we said it to our players as well, is if we have the ability to make profits, that it's just, frankly, unsustainable over right. time if it's not a profitable business. And in the, in the so-called old days, when it was roughly break even, or maybe you made a million or lost a million, maybe you could sustain it that way. But when you're building, I mean, now we're at the point where, I mean, newer, the, the, the Knicks are investing a billion dollars just in renovating an existing arena. The, the Nets have invested close to you know, $800 million in building a new arena. You can't run these businesses anymore unless there's a model that makes them profitable, no matter how much right. enjoyment comes from being right. a team owner. But you would yeah. probably agree that with the increasing sophistication of, of marketing and the reach, and as teams become the centerpieces of regional media networks and regional real estate empires, that the ability to generate profits not just a cash flow enough to sustain until you get out of the business, is also increasing. I mean, the, 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 it the is, profits, but I, I would the just profits say are there because the demand is there. Let, let me just give you one, just before we leave, the, before we agree that profits are the, the, the focus and not the resale value or revenues or the asset class, I just want to bring up one number. Uh, and I, I'll pick on the Golden State Warriors because they're doing really well now. Um, but in the decade before... And they left town, so they, they can't hear you. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't know that, but that's even better. Um, in the decade before the team sold, um, they were 130 games under 500. And the team sold for $450 million, which was 24% more than Forbes said they were worth. Um, I don't know if you could find a, a better example of a basket case franchise in what should be a wonderful market, and there were owners, prospective owners, who were willing to pay that price, and they're, I think it seems like they're making out quite nicely. Um, that's one point. I think the second point is, whatever the extent to which profits matter, I think we hear about profits a lot during labor disputes. It's very common for owners to come out, I think, and say, well, we're losing money, we're losing money, and, and that resonates with fans, because after all, who doesn't want to make money? But I'm sure you've heard the analogy of owning sports teams being like owning rare art or an art collection, something rare and precious that doesn't often come to market. If you own the Mona Lisa in some years, you may pay more on air conditioning and security uh, than you take in from the tickets you sell for people to come see the Mona Lisa. But your name will be in the headlines. Uh, you'll be famous as the guy who owns the Mona Lisa. Um, there may be tax breaks associated with your collection, uh, maybe not with art, but there are certainly with, with owning sports franchises. And when you sell the Mona Lisa, you're pretty sure to make a lot more money than you paid but for I, it. I'm not, I'm not sure what point you were making with Golden State. I will say that you know a team sells on based on future prospects, and so you have an ownership group that came in, paid a high value for the team, has put on the table a plan to build a new arena in San Francisco, privately financed, um, and. The, a lot of the numbers in Golden State were misleading because they came up in, in collective bargaining because somebody could say, well, this group bought the team for X and then sold it for Y. Didn't they make an enormous profit? And we say, yeah, but you for left out the enormous losses they were incurring every year they owned the team. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what, you know, what conclusion you're drawing from Golden State. Just that smart investors thought there was value there, even in a situation, more value than even independent estimates uh, projected. 
Stan uh, already spoke to Forbes. Yeah, <laughs> that, that cracks me up. You can keep saying it as many times as you want, but we haven't yet. I, I, I don't know. Here's the problem with Forbes and their valuations. I don't know their methodology. For instance, I don't know which hand they throw their dart with when they're deciding <laughs> on a value for the, because well, they're never, look, look, right? They're never even in the ballpark. Look, that's fair. That They're not my estimates, so let me ask you guys. What do, let me ask all of you. What do sports teams trade on a multiple of? Is it earnings? Is it revenues? Is it nothing we can figure out? Is it uh, I, I, something I, I, else? I, I, I think since, since, since I, I've been in the most recent transaction, I will tell you, as Adam said, as the numbers are getting bigger, obviously there's a lot more focus on numbers and on EBITDA and future profits and all of that. When it was smaller, it was easier to, you know, fit into some pocket of your company and just enjoy the enjoyment or imagine that I'll make it all back on the resale. Um, but we do definitely look at ongoing day-to-day, year-to-year numbers. Um, and as Adam said, we definitely look at what's the long term, what's the upside. And I don't know any owner, any, in any sport that came in that didn't think, I can make it better, I can fix it, um, and I can make it so that it really pays off at the end. Golden State's a great example. Um, if there were not a plan or the possibility of a magnificent new complex with a lot more revenues, I don't think they would have paid that price. Same, same with the Dodgers. We obviously had expectations in that marketplace of seeing a return. Uh, having said that, we still want to be in the baseball business. And, and Peter Goober, one of the owners there, who's a partner of mine, the Dodgers, wanted to be in the basketball business. But they kept an eye on the business elements as well. And they're envisioning a return down the road, but, but very much not necessarily annual or year to year. So, uh, we agree then that one aspect of the growth of this business and the growth of the complexity of sports ownership is that teams are actually selling based on a comparison of what's reasonable to some metrics, not just the greater fool stepping in and saying, I want to own an NBA team, here's my money. I think no question, and also when you get to valuations um, at a billion, over a billion now for some NBA teams, you're running out of people, I mean the pool of people or even corporate interest that can pay that kind of money just doesn't exist under the greater fool theory. I mean, I, I think these are sophisticated investors. I mean, you know, Jonathan can speak to it, who go in with, with again, I mean, part of the vetting process with an owner coming in is to understand their the business plan because their partners in the league don't want to see somebody begin to lose money. It affects all the teams. It affects the positions we take in collective bargaining and ultimately affects the growth of the league because like any business, unless there are profits to reinvest, we're not going to grow. You know, all the sophisticated marketing and analytics that we're talking, that have been talked about here at this conference cost money. I mean, the people, you know, you asked what some of the differences are. The caliber of the people who are coming into the business is much greater. We're competing against other industries for the top people. And so all of those things mean we have to be in a position to, to treat these assets like real businesses. I, I, can I say one thing yeah, that Adam please. just said? I talked earlier about how we paid $173 million for zero EBITDA. But the, the reason we were comfortable doing it was we bought the team in January of 94. The 94 season was the first season that the NFL was going to have a salary cap. And we were very excited about what a true salary cap, a hard cap, meant for uh, the business of football. Because now you were going to compete, not by how much you wanted to deficit spend or how rich you were outside the business. Everybody was going to have the exact same amount of money to play with. And you were going to be measured by how well you could spot talent, sign it up, and coach it up relative to the competition. And football yet was very much a subjective business with old school football guys and analytics and numbers and traditional business type of thinking had never really been brought into play. Your owner might have said to football, here's your budget, go do what you want, but they could always cajole more out of it. And, and that's what got us excited and was one of the real reasons that we were willing to pay up because we thought you could start to bring business disciplines to the football side and, 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 and fortunately, um, you know, that was the case and Jets fans have been ruined the day. Um, 
It's too bad. <laughs> I, I know I, you feel bad about that. I do, terrible. <laughs> be, be, uh, I, I had uh, emailed around to our panelists and asked them if they had questions for each other, and I said I wouldn't say who gave us the question, but I would ask the question. So we got one question for John Skipper, which is, what would you do in your first 100 days as a team owner? Um, well, if I bought an NBA team, I'd trade for LeBron the first day. <laughs> And then the second day, I'd trade for Kobe. And then I'd do one of those Harlem Shuffle uh, dance <laughs> contests the third day. Um, uh, look at, you know, f first of all, you got to kind of figure out why I'm even up here, by the way. It uh, might be confusing, but it's probably based upon my significant real estate holdings in uh, <laughs> Wilton, Connecticut. I've been, for, after 19 years of onerous monthly payments, I own 10% of a a hundred year old colonial house and <laughs> I think it's just a matter of scale. I got parking issues, I got uh, maintenance issues and <laughs> renovation issues just on a smaller Ebita scale. You got EBITDA issues. Yeah. The, I, I do think the, the um, look, we, we manage our business on something I think it's also important I would assume to Stan and Jonathan and all their um, colleagues. We, we manage it by thinking about fans. So if I was going to uh, suddenly be handed a franchise. I think what I would spend my time thinking about is the fan experience, talking to fans. I know that happens. I know smart owners email with fans, talk to fans at the games, try to think about the fan experience. I would assume other than the operations of the team and the personnel, it probably occupies the most time uh, because that sort of is the measure of success. So I, I think you'd start there, right? Assuming you really couldn't get the heat to trade LeBron. That's where I'd start. Well, let me ask you, what, what do you think um, in this environment, what, what do teams owe their fans? Um, do, do you, are you out to provide a particular kind of fan experience? I'll start with, with you, Stan. Um, beyond trying to put together a winning team, what, what, what elements of the fan experience I, I, concern you? I don't think of the word oh. I, I think of it differently. I, I don't refer to my fans as fans. I refer to them as customers, and I think they do better when I think of them that way. And when I talk to my staff, I remind them these are our customers because if you think of someone as a customer, you know you've got to win their business every day in everything you do. And everyone through every department, whether it's accounting or sales or advertising, you're touching our customer, and that experience has to be the best, the easiest, the, the most convenient possible. So, so it's not me owing them anything for their loyalty. I happen to live in a city where the loyalty is historic, is legendary, and I'm thankful for that. But it means nothing if I'm not working hard to win their business every day, to encourage them, to give them a reason to support me. Yeah. I, I do and, assume, Stan, you think as a new owner of the Dodgers that you have a certain stewardship almost, right? I mean, you yeah. see people walking around town wearing Dodger hats. You... I, I think we are in a unique situation right. a, a, as perhaps the price suggested. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, <laughs> we do have this. There's no franchise in American sports that has had the impact on popular culture or society at large as the Dodgers because of its outreach to so many different communities, from Jackie Robinson, Sandy Koufax, to Fernando Valenzuela, right. Hideo Nomo, Channel Park. We just keep touching all of these uh, uh, different demographics. And so, and so that is a unique aspect of the Dodgers. But at the end of the day, it's the same business that Jonathan's in, that an NBA owner is in. We have to win customers. And you do that by providing the best service and the best product. But, but also, let me give you a, a different perspective, which is the league perspective. There are, it's a zero-sum game in terms of the numbers of wins and losses. We can't manufacture more wins on a collective basis <coughs> for our 30 teams. Therefore, in the aggregate, we have to sell something more than wins. I think, you know, Mark Cuban was the one who famously said when he first bought his team that any of my salespeople who talks about wins is, is going to be out of a job. And I think from a, a league standpoint, and, and Kevin Murphy, economist from University of Chicago, mentioned this to me before the panel, that there's so much focus on analytics for teams, but we need to begin spending more time on analytics for leagues, which is how to grow in the aggregate. And it can't be based on selling wins in the aggregate, because there are the exact same number of wins every year. Does that extend to any obligation on uh, affordability or price? Um, if you look at the average cost of a ticket in any, league, in any of the big leagues, or the average cost of a beer or a hot dog or soda across leagues, um, over the past five or ten years, 
basically whatever frame, frame you want to look at, it's gone up much faster than uh, average American incomes. And, and when we do our franchise rankings, I hear over and over again from fans who still love their teams, identify with their teams, but feel like they're being priced out of what is becoming almost a luxury experience. And fans, I mean, teams have done, many teams have done a great job, the Patriots among them, of, of, of making game day, of aiming game day at fans who are very likely to spend and thereby maximizing team revenues. Um, it, how concerned are any of you that that, that leaves that there's a chance that that leaves a large chunk of fans behind and out of the actual game experience. The I, I, only thing I'll say is I was at the Celtics game last night, and I didn't see a whole bunch of corporate millionaires and folks. I saw a whole bunch of people in Celtic jerseys who looked to me like they uh, had been working Monday through Friday, and they had their families with them, and they were up and screaming. I don't mean by any means to, to be dismissive of how difficult it can be for many American families to afford lots of uh, experiences, but I just don't see it for the most part. I mean, the people we saw around us last night, I think were local citizens for whom it is a special experience. I mean, they're not, this is not, you know, $4, $4 seats, but uh, I, I still don't see it. I hear that a lot. I don't, as I travel around, I do not see people in, I do not see arenas full of, of uh, suits for the most part. Madison Square Garden potentially accepted, and that's because everybody's coming from work. I, from, <clears throat> from our perspective, first, we're lucky in football with the limited number of home games and season ticket holders, and I think from our perspective, as we look to revenue growth in the future, we, we know the real revenue growth isn't coming from fan spending on tickets and on in-stadium revenue opportunities. We, we've actually, we really haven't raised our ticket prices since 07. I think three or 4,000 seats went up a year ago. But other than that, we've stayed constant with our ticket pricing without any increases. And we have a paid waiting list that exceeds 60,000 today. Which means you could raise prices. Right. And, or, or you're just and, shifting. Well, value it, it, to, to the secondary market. No, but we, we police, we don't allow our tickets to be traded on the secondary market. We have a private exchange where season ticket holders can sell at face value to the wait list and other season ticket holders. And fortunately, it's been liquid enough because of the numbers that it works. I think we are sensitive to, to what, what you described, uh, Peter, in, in, in terms of the economics. and feel like with a top four or five ticket price in the league and everything else going on, we, we don't want to continue to find ourselves at a point in the future where people really can't afford it. And we un we're looking at other areas to, to, to grow our revenues. Be and maybe if you didn't pay for your stadium privately and weren't really worried about keeping those seats full, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be as much of a problem, but that, that, that's where we come out on that. Obviously, teams have, different teams have very different approaches to that, public and private financing, attention that they pay or don't pay to the secondary market, all of these issues. One of the questions we got was for, for Adam, which is how, how is, how is it even possible to manage as disparate and diverse a group as owners are in a league? <laughs> yeah, I was going to suggest yeah, yeah, that commissioner yeah. Yeah. was the best yeah, job I when you were asking that. about yeah. owners. Because yeah. uh, who doesn't talk to me in a year? But um, <laughs> I, I, I would just say, uh, you know, I mean, it's the owners in some ways are self-managing. I mean, of course, the commissioner, you know, works for the owners. There are committees. You know, Stan, when he was the representative of the Hawks, was a very <laughs> active operator in terms of the league. Um, you know, we we operate more like a corporation than people might understand in terms of we have a board of governors, which is the equivalent of a board of directors. I mean, of course, there are great variances, and one of the goals of the league is to make the, ex the experience more consistent throughout the league in terms of how teams approach their fans. We have a group within the league office called, um, we, we call it Teambo for short, Team Marketing and Business Operations, um, run by someone named Chris Granger. And in fact, speaking of analytics, they took advantage of this conference to have their own conference um, leading into this one where virtually every team was represented and they talk about ways better ways to price tickets better ways to price sponsorships I mean I, I 
I mean, every I, I team sends somebody to that group? Every team sends someone to that, to that group. And I mean, to Jonathan's point, I mean, you, you have varying levels of sophistication within league and, and various levels of investment. But at the end of the, end of the day, I mean, seemingly every um, team wants to fill its arena. It's a different business in the NBA when you have 41 home games plus playoffs plus preseason. But we find that if we don't price to market, the market adjust makes the adjustments for you. If you're if you're if you're selling below market artificially, which we've tried to do. I mean, I don't, I don't make, want to make light of your point about making the, the games affordable. But if we artificially force prices down, what we find is that you have such a sophisticated secondary market now that people are just buying that largely. Brokers are buying those tickets and just moving them on the secondary market, and which is bad for a lot of reasons. And if you overprice your tickets, which some, certainly some teams have done, you end up lowering prices. In fact, one team just announced that they're lowering prices across the board for next year because their prices are too high. So I, I would say, I mean, you know, it's, it's we manage owners and owners manage us. I mean, I think they're constantly one of the things we try to do is encourage. And, and that's sort of what this, this Teambo group does, is share best practices with each other. Well, teams want to you know, kill each other on the court. They're partners off the court. They're partners in building the business, in, in um, taking best practices, culling them from each other, sharing them, growing in sophistication. We learn from other leagues. Yep. We share information you know, across leagues in terms of certain, certain ways to approach customers. It's really interesting to hear you say that because it seems like as, as sports gets bigger, uh, sports get bigger, leagues are learning lessons that maybe other fields of entertainment had to learn. I mean, you know, there's a knee-jerk reaction among mm -hmm. a lot of fans that lower prices have to be better as set by teams. But as you just pointed out, um, well, that just means scalpers can buy up a bunch of cheap tickets. And, you know, Bruce Springsteen wanted to keep ticket prices down for his concert, so he cut ticket prices, and that just meant that the ticket-buying exchanges bought thousands and thousands right. of tickets, so, you know, he tries to let people in by a lottery right before the show, right? I mean, there's, there's no easy answers to a lot of these questions of affordability or service. I, I'm always you know, intrigued by the PSL issue. Um, fans and a lot of media are outraged at public seat licenses, but if you want your team to spend money on free agents, you want your team to recapture as much value as it can from the secondary market, and by the way, if you're a season ticket holder, you're probably turning around and selling half your tickets anyway, so there's a lot of cross currents there. It's not all just teams got to keep prices down. But what you say brings up, I mean, this leads right into something I want to ask you guys about, about the role of the commissioner. I think another thing that fans always think is that the commissioner, many, many fans still have the idea of a commissioner of a league acting independently for the best interest of the sport, sort of on a different plane than the owners. And, and I want to ask each of you whether that's even possible or has a shred of truth anymore, or whether the commissioner actually in modern sports just acts as the representative of the owners. I mean, because well, all the time, somebody fails a drug test, the grass turns brown in the outfield, fans will say, the commissioner ought to do something about this. And I, I think that Kennesaw Mountain Landis image is what a lot of fans still have in their mind, and I, I'm not sure yeah, it's I, even close I, to I, reality. I think, I think the Landis model is outdated. That's certainly not how we view modern-day commissioners, but, but uh, and, and I think we should say without any embarrassment that they work for the owners, they are hired by the owners, they are representative of the owners, but their job is the steward of the best interests of the game. Their job is to make sure the competition is the best it can be, and that serves everyone's purposes. That serves the players' purposes. That serves the fans' purposes. And that's why there are days when the commissioner's job is to discipline a team or a team owner. And that will be done, even though he's working for that team owner or many owners. So yes, they work for the owners, but his job is the best interest of the game, which is to the benefit of all interested parties. Yeah, and I, I, I agree completely, and I think the owners understand that there, it's critical that we have a, a rule of law on which, in which we operate the league. And a perfect example is last night I was at the Celtic Golden State game and I ran into the owner of the Warriors and of course we suspended David Lee for a game earlier this week and he said, I passionately disagree with that decision to suspend David Lee, but he accepts that that's our job, I respect his disagreement and we all understand that 
he can't be part of that process to make that decision, that it has to be done in an independent way. Over time, if owners are dissatisfied with the way the league has been run, they can replace management. But at least on a day-to-day -day basis, I think owners understand that their self-interest doesn't necessarily align with the greater interest of the league. Yeah, and, and for instance, uh, let, let's talk about drug penalties and the program like that. Uh, an individual owner would be very tempted to treat their star player differently from their 12th man. And we can't have that if we're going to have any kind of common sense to the enforcement of our rules. And that's why we need the office of the commissioner, the central body overseeing these things, as, as I said, for the benefit of everyone. The, the, the league office, though, too, the commissioners today, to talk about the evolution of it, they're really Fortune 500 type CEOs. You're, you're, you're managing a brand. No, it's the truth. <coughs> I say it about Roger all the time, and I have good, what little we know each I have great respect for you and for David. You're, you have a brand, much like one of the elements John has to manage every day. You have a brand that is globally worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. And team owners can say they care about the NFL Shield or the NBA Shield, but at the end of the day, they're selfish, and as you'd expect, and they're focused on their business. If you think about Adam's job, he's got to answer to 29, is there, are there 20, 30. 30? There are 30 teams in the NBA, so he's got 30 members of his board of directors, which is more than any Fortune 500 company CEO has, and they're all pretty well-to-do and vocal guys and gals, and you've got to answer to them. But at the same so, time... And some teams have multiple owners. Right, and some teams have multiple <laughs> owners. For, yeah, we, fortunately we don't. Um, and, but you have to manage a brand that's worth literally tens of billions of dollars. You have a major labor issue with a union that's vocal and visible. You've got sponsors. You've got media deals to do. You've got licensing. It is a real job. And you can't just have somebody who's a diplomat with owners. You, you need a CEO, a real business CEO. And I really believe that that's what Adam is, that's what Roger is, and, and, and they do what John does every day. It's a real job, real job. I don't think people fully appreciate the scale and the magnitude of those jobs and, and the visibility. Their, their brands that they're managing are more visible than virtually any other consumer brands in the world. Well, they seem to be doing a pretty good job of it because in the last few labor disputes, I think, um, at least in the NBA and the NHL, for sure, I, I think the, the final result was a lot closer to what owners proposed than to what players had originally wanted. Let me start with you. Do, do you think we're even going to see more lockouts or labor disputes? Do you think we're in an environment where, where ownership has, has, has pretty much won? Because it's, I think it's now established that players are not, you know, there was a moment where it seemed like the NBA players might go out and barnstorm themselves or guys had talked about starting their own league. I, I think players have relatively short careers and most have now realized that, that they don't, especially in hockey where they've gone through two of these lockouts, players are not prepared either to organize themselves or to sacrifice a big chunk of their careers if that's what it's going to take. And it seems like ownership is kind of as a structural advantage in these labor disputes now. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand it well enough to comment on that. I'm not sure I would characterize that these were victories for one side or the other. I think both sides understand that a lockout is a defeat for both sides, right? Nobody's winning when nobody's playing. We're not winning, they're not winning, the league's not winning, fans aren't winning. And my guess would be it's more appropriate to think of the last negotiations. You know, you're moving back and forth along a continuum. And I think for both the NBA and the NHL, they felt like there needed to be some correction for the reason Adam suggested earlier. They were transparent about the finances of their teams. I, I, we, we're in business with the leagues, but we're also in business with the players. So we try to stay out of these, but it was fairly convincing that there were lots and lots of teams not making money. Nobody believes that's a good situation. And again, in these recent settlements, I think the players are still receiving an appropriate amount of the uh, of the uh, compensation here relative to, you know, it, I, I, you know, we certainly aren't paying our employees 50 percent of, uh, of uh, our revenues. But that, you might uh, want to look into that. Yeah, yeah we, we have looked into it and we, we find <laughs> it to be highly, uh, highly uh, illogical. <laughs> <laughs>
But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm trying to explain that a little bit from sort of my perspective. I, I don't think, Adam, you guys thought we won or we lost, and you want a settlement that, that allows you to have long-term help for your league so that you can do business with us and present your game to fans. That's, that's what you're engaged in, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I mean, that wasn't the sense at all that, you know, missing a big chunk of our season and coming out with a deal where the players were guaranteed 50% in essence of the gross revenue of the league. I mean, certainly we didn't see that as a victory at all. It was far from what we set out to accomplish in bargaining in terms of the system elements as well, hard cap versus soft cap, et cetera. But I thought it was a fair compromise. And frankly, I thought it was a fair compromise from the player's standpoint as well. And I'd also say on behalf of the players that they have enormous leverage. I mean, we never even suggested in this negotiation that there were going to be replacement players or that we could substitute another group of players for the best players in the world. And so, therefore, they have enormous leverage. Uh, I mentioned Kevin Murphy earlier, an economist from the University of Chicago who sat at the negotiating table representing the players. Jeff Kessler, who's very active for a lot of sports league unions representing our players. So these are, these are highly sophisticated people. It's, it, it, it's a complex negotiation with um, enormous leverage for both sides. So I wouldn't characterize it at all as a, as a win. I can't speak specifically to the NHL, but it's my same sense from a distance there that they were ultimately fair resolutions. And I would just say under this new collective bargaining agreement, we're still not at the point where, unlike as I understand the NFL, that all the teams are profitable. We're hoping to work toward that point under the new deal. And we're hoping that some of the system elements achieve greater parity throughout the league as well and putting every team in a position where they can compete. I think to your point before about what do fans want, fans want to know that a management group can invest the time and resources in the team and be in a position to compete for championships regardless of the market or market size. I think that's something they've accomplished in the NFL and that we're still striving to achieve in the NBA. Where do you guys see your competition? You see it among other owners and other teams within your league or other leagues in big, big time sports or in other forms of entertainment or in threats to the, to the larger economy. What, what keeps you guys up at night? Let's start with you, Jonathan. It's definitely not our partners in the NFL. There are competition on the field, but not off of it. I think at the end of the day, the, the real threat in terms of interest would be other forms of entertainment and a changing technological landscape where people just grow up in a way with much shorter attention spans than three hour and five minute windows on Sunday and whether it's extreme sports or something else that captures their attention and, and pulls them away. And, and so we work, we, we think about that a lot and we work very hard on making the complete entertainment experience and, and the idea of being a fan of our team 24-7, 365, give you outlets to exploit <laughs> that and, and get further attached to, to what we're doing to try to make sure the passion stays there and that most importantly, you then go and instill it in kids. And we're lucky because as we develop fantasy football games, for example, we think about the games for each age group and want to try to get young kids who we know their parents today are fortunately watching it, develop fantasy football games for that group of kids at the younger ages and get them sucked into watching it and feeling the excitement and the passion that exists in our game because we know it's going to be hard to compete for their attention as teenagers if they already haven't gotten addicted to it. In yeah. a good way, addicted I, to it. I, 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 I think uh, our challenge is, I think, a little greater uh, uh, than Jonathan's on, on a very um, grassroots level. We have uh, 162 games, and we have 56,000 seats. And, and so I worry about all the competition I have out there to, for the mind share of my customers. Uh, interesting, when he talks about fantasy games, I think there's an opportunity for us uh, in the baseball business to, uh, to gain some mind share uh, because now we're all getting accustomed to uh, watching television with the second screen on our lap, with our laptops, with our iPads. And I think we need to bring that increasingly into the ballparks too. It's why we're spending time with greater scoreboards, with more apps in stadium things because baseball 
is unique in that it really has a pause in between every, every pitch, unlike hockey and unlike basketball. So we really can utilize the second screen experience that we're also familiar with away from the ballpark. If we can perfect that second screen experience while you're at the ballpark, it might help us attract this new generation of fans. And, and that's what I'm worried about because we do have so many seats to fill for so many events. You want to tell us about your, do you, do you have a particular nightmare to, uh, well, to share? I, I certainly agree with, with everything these guys have said. I, I think there's no question we're competing against all their entertainment options in the marketplace. Um, our tickets, as you said earlier, are expensive and we're selling 41 home games, so we're competing against any other product, any other attraction in the marketplace. But, and maybe even more importantly, we're competing for time and you know, in, as Jonathan said, I mean, his games are three hours, our games are two and a half hours. That's an enormous time commitment in this day and age, especially when there's so many other options. I mean, just take it from a television standpoint. One of the things we look at most closely is it's not just your average rating, but it's, it's the duration, the amount of time that any given fan will dedicate to a single match. And I mean, think about the programs when you see a list of, how, of ratings. I often think even as well as the NFL does, it, it, a rating onto itself doesn't even demonstrate how popular they are because it's a three-hour program often being listed in a series of ratings of programs that are often a half hour that might be the third highest rated program. So you could lift, list the NFL game as you know, six programs instead of, of one program. And so having a long product, having you know, in this day and age, as, as, as Jonathan mentioned, as younger people aren't used to sitting for as much time or flipping channels, have second, third screens, you know, they have a computer screen, they have a phone. You're com it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's part of why so much is being invested in analytics. You're competing for people's attention and we have to respond accordingly, whether it's changes in the rules, changes in the presentation of the product, it's something we're constantly looking at. Yeah, so I can't stay awake during the day, so nothing mm -hmm. keeps me awake at night. <laughs> And the only thing I would say is in the aggregate, sports competes very well. I mean, again, as a baseball owner, you have to think about competing with other sports entertainment. But in an aggregate, sports has never been in a more central position than it is right now. It accounts for a high, the highest percentage of television viewing that it's ever accounted for, and that is only going to go up. Uh, there is nothing more valuable in the current media landscape, and we all participated in it to the some extent in the last uh, year or two than sports media rights. They are the single most valuable uh, form of entertainment right now, and I don't think that's going to change. I mean, I grew up in a, an era where there were other things that kept people together and people had commonality. Right now, the most tribal thing in our society is your sports loyalty and who you pull for. It is the one thing in the sort of divided society, and I don't mean all that as pejorative, right? People have more and more things to do. Technology provides more and more opportunities but a commonality is people's sports teams. I can guarantee that in any given audience that you look at, I always use focus groups, that if you have people come into a focus group and they're not quite sure what to talk about to this nine, eight or nine or 10 strangers in a room, they will almost invariably, particularly if it's men, they will start talking about sports uh, because that is what they have in common. So again, it's why you see the values of teams increasing. It's why you see the complexity of sort of what Adam has to do. It's why you see the sort of centrality of uh, sports media companies relative to ratings and, 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 um, and, and attention. Let's talk for one second about how that's going to reach fans. We have a question from the audience for you. Um, with a subscriber model and rising rights costs, will the idea of the traditional network sport, just flipping on your TV and watching sports for free, um, is that going to die or phase out? Well, the idea of flipping on sports, first of all, you don't actually watch it for free. You have to pay to get a uh, pay television subscription. Uh, but I guess I think when you cut your television on, you assume that you have infinite, uh, infinite value, infinite uh, amount of time you spend on sports. No, I don't think it's going to change. What we're primarily focused on is providing more and more. I always get the question, uh, is there saturation? And the answer is no. If your team is Bowden, or your team is a, is a triple, a double A team uh, in San Jose, you want to see the game. You, you're not saturated until all of the games that you want to see are available on every screen and every device, and that's <coughs> our intention 
uh, to do that. We don't see any saturation. We don't see any change. It doesn't matter if business models change. If you have the best product, which is live games, either in the arena or on a mobile device or on a television screen, there's going to be value to that. and There's going to be business models that work. Yeah, uh, Peter, can I say, uh, in Atlanta, um, Ted Turner used to have a theater at CNN Center dedicated to the greatest movie ever made, Gone with the Wind. He loved that movie, loved it so much, everyone would want to see it. And this theater played Gone with the Wind every day of the year, 24 hours a day. And it ran out of steam because there was only so many people who were ever going to watch Gone with the Wind again and again and again. I think that's and, only a good and, thing. And, exactly. And, and that's what, good that, that's that's what set yeah. us apart. We're not watching the same great movie a dozen times or the same set of reruns. We're a different show every night with different characters and a different ending. And I agree with John. That doesn't look like it's going to end. It's what we need. It's endless, it's endless human drama, yeah. right? Competition, stories. Yeah. Uh, there's also a question about revenue sharing. Different leagues have very different models for revenue sharing based on years of working agreements out. If you could start from scratch, what do you think the best way would be to share revenues uh, in, in your league? And I'll start, with, uh, I'll start with you, Jonathan. Well, I think in our league we have it. Um, we're very fortunate that um, the big market teams that were owned by families back in the 50s and the, the 60s is when it happened, came together and said for there to be competitive balance in the NFL as we become more of a national television product, we need to share our television money equally. And clearly the TV money drives a disproportionate share of what goes on in our league. We share our gate two thirds, one third, the home team keeps two thirds and one third goes into a pool each week. And at the end of the year, that, that pool of one third gets divided uh, equally, so it keeps some entrepreneurial desire because you get a disproportionate share of it in your market and you want to sell it out. And then what you get to keep 100% for yourself are your local sponsorships, promotions, and media rights. And I think that helps to do two things. It, it rewards the people that want to be entrepreneurial, but also the costs of operating a franchise in New York or Boston are much greater than operating a franchise in Green Bay or Kansas City. And so the fact that we are in larger markets where you can get a little bit more for your radio rights and there's probably a bigger corporate base for local and regional sponsorships uh, allows you to then generate incremental revenue that can go to pay your incremental costs of operations outside of the players. The, the last thing, too, that we share equally is our licensing. So the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants get as much from the licensing of the logos in the league as um, you know, the San Diego Chargers and the Jacksonville Jaguars, and I, th I think it works. It does. It's a, a, a somewhat different mix in the NBA, right? Yeah, well, in fact, we did start from scratch two years ago along with a new collective bargaining agreement, and while you know, I, 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 it's far from the perfect system, we also try, try to strike the right balance between collective revenues on one hand and the right incentives to generate revenue, on the other hand, in a team market. So in essence, we have, in essence, local games, unlike the NFL, local television games. So, I mean, it's a, it's, we think of it as a federalistic model, sort of states' rights, and then the national system. So a team keeps, for the most part, its gate, its ticket revenue. I mean, there's a, there's a, a tax, in essence, that goes to the league, but the team keeps its ticket revenue and for the most part keeps its local television money, all other revenue, whether it's merchandising, national television, or increasingly international revenue, is divided in 30 parts among the teams. We then have a system, an overlay, on top of that where teams, not large markets, but teams that <coughs> generate more revenue, and they're not always the largest markets, then share a percentage of that revenue back centrally, and it's distributed to those teams that have lower revenues. But what made our system, what, which we created, I'd say the, the, the greatest amount of debate and the complexity in the league office was we wanted to ensure that all along that we were, had the proper incentives because it didn't seem <coughs> fair on one hand that take the Knicks, that they would be investing a billion dollars in renovating their arena and then we wouldn't be taking it into account 
that enormous investment in terms of the capital investment in the new arena and the resources in the team when we decided how much they shared. So there's a system of credits and there's also a system for the lower generating teams where we tried to create the greatest incentives possible so they're not just receiving checks from the high grossing teams, that they're also incentivized to invest, whether it be in upgrading their arenas or upgrading in resources to generate more revenue at the team level. Uh, we, we uh, I, I've been a big market, I've been a small market. <laughs> Wherever I've been, I, I, I've been an advocate for a sensible uh, uh, revenue sharing plan. Uh, David Stern came a little late to this party. David and I had many energetic conversations <coughs> over the years about the need for revenue sharing of basketball, and, and, and I think they've made great progress. And so have we in baseball, but I think uh, uh, the, the best thing that has happened in baseball over the last decade was the decision 10, 12 years ago, whenever we started MLB Advanced Media, to pool all of those <laughs> rights and that money gets shared. And we're hoping that for the 21st century that becomes like the decision made by the NFL in 1960 to pool their TV revenues. I think it's been fantastic for the success of the league and therefore for all of its fans. And we think that move in baseball should operate the same way over the coming years. We have uh, time for one last question question and I want to end on a, on a metric. So let me ask you, we touched on this before, <coughs> but if, if there's one bottom line number that you would use to evaluate the stewardship of an owner, your success, um, what would it be? Would it be championships, resale value, some measure of fan satisfaction? What's the bottom line for, for, for you as an owner or the owners in your sport? You know, I don't know. I, I, you, you named three great ones there, and I don't know that I could pick one over any of the others. We, we, we want to win championships, but to have an energized fan base that really re appreciates you, that's important. Uh, when you ask commissioners, they will tell you their job is, is the growth of asset value because they're CEOs of companies. Peter, I think they're all, they're all important, and I think the job done properly, you can accomplish all of that. You shouldn't sacrifice one for any other. I, um, I think the owners are under analytic and I would ask this challenge this group that UCI should be trying to figure out the OR, which is the owner wins above replacement. <laughs> well, well but, but, but that brings up the anomaly though that Peter and I were discussing earlier when, when, when he does his rankings huh? of franchises. I, I'll never forget a few years ago when uh, on his rankings the owner of the Detroit Red Wings was voted the best owner in all of sports whereas the owner of the Detroit Tigers was voted the worst owner in all sports. Guy. And it's the same guy. It just depended <laughs> on how the team was to be doing. fair, to be fair, this is based on fan surveys. So yeah. well, it was the objective, the subjective experiences of the Red Wings and Tigers <laughs> yeah. fans that were, that were registering in that No, but I had to that explain survey. that to my but, new but, owners, that here's how it's going to work, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. everyone knows that if you own two businesses, you, you can, Cle clearly you a can care for one more than another. <laughs> yeah. and, and Peter, just to, to throw in the league perspective, again, by definition for a league, it can't be championships because there's only one championship to go around every season. So you've and got a perfect 30. score. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so from my standpoint, it's got to be some measure of fan satisfaction, and I think that's the appropriate way to measure the, the team ownership stewards, and it's the, ultimately the way to measure the league. It's sort of, are we increasing our customer base and are our customers happy with Does the, the product? Does the NBA grade teams <laughs> internally, on, on <laughs> team by team, on, on measures of yes, fan sure. satisfaction, independent of what the teams do? We, uh, fan yeah. satisfaction, um, uh, you know, quality of service, um, game presentation, um, quality of sales force, and they grade each other. It's not just the league office. Now we're going to give Jonathan, the, does we're give Jonathan the last word here. Here's the metric I would use because I don't know what the number is, but it would be impact on your community because impact on your community encompasses championships and winning, but it also encompasses the general feeling that a well-run competitive franchise can generate in pride in the community over the long run mm -hmm. and what you can do philanthropically and with kids and by raising awareness and setting an example. And I think it really is all of that wrapped up into one if you're gonna measure an owner at the end of a tenor, tenure, it's impact. And a guy like Jerry Buss who, you know, mm -hmm. 
God rest his soul, I think. And he had an in big impact in his industry too, but it's impact on your community. Well, I think on, on that own note of ownership as a community trust, that's a great note to end on. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you.